Welcome everyone to our webinar. This is just a quick administrative overview. If you're having any issues joining the Zoom, you can join from your browser. And if you go to the Zoom launch meeting webpage, you should see on the bottom of the page a statement that says having issues with the Zoom app and then a link to join from your browser. You can also call into the webinar by phone and I'll post that information in the chat in just a moment. This webinar will be recorded. Please use the chat box to share questions or comments, which you will find at the bottom of your Zoom window, and you can use the reactions button to raise your hand. Please keep yourself on mute until the Q&A portion of the webinar when we will invite you to ask questions and unmute yourself if you'd like to speak. This webinar is 60 minutes, and if you'd like to enable captions, you can do so by clicking show captions, which is on the bottom right of your screen. And I will hand it over to Alicia. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for the third webinar of the three-part series. I am Alicia Sylvester. I am a tribal member of the Pueblo of Amos from New Mexico, and I serve as the DOD Senior Tribal Advisor and Liaison within the Office of the Secretary of Defense. And I also manage the Native American Lands Environmental Mitigation Program. Today's webinar, Recognizing Native Hawaiian Reserve Rights, will outline the foundations in the 1840 Hawaiian Constitution and other documents of a uniquely Native Hawaiian system of private land ownership. It will explain how the system reserved rights for the Native Hawaiian people in the Crown, the Kingdom of Hawaii, and government lands currently occupied by military installations, as well as access through private and public lands, including lands used by the military. We are very fortunate to have collaborated with today's featured speaker, Dr. Daviana Bomakai McGregor, Professor Emerita of Ethnic Studies and Oral History at the University of Hawaii, Manoa. She is a historian of Hawaii and the Pacific. Dr. McGregor, McGregor's ongoing research endeavors have focused on documenting the persistence of traditional Hawaiian cultural customs beliefs and practices in rural Hawaiian communities. Dr. McGregor, mahalo nui for honoring us for sharing your knowledge with us today. We look forward to your presentation. Over to you. Okay. Aloha everyone. Uh, welcome. Um, I don't know where you're all coming from. I'm in Hawaii in Honolulu and um, look forward to sharing um, today. I um, usually start with a a chat that um, introduces who I am. I will uh, do a short chat that talks about my family and our uh, Aina in Haula on the island of Oahu. And it's by way of greeting you to Aloha Mauna Wila Ika Malie Malie Ika Malui Loko Pamoaho Holopuna iki ke kai kapalawa Halia aloha makua kaumana Mai ha alulu i kaleo Eo kama aina E mauna limahana no kea aina E a oya So, um Today I'll be talking about um, uh, the reserved rights of Native Hawaiians. I'm going to start with, though, a little background on the definition of Native Hawaiian, uh, how we say Native Hawaiian in our own language, uh, how many Native Hawaiians are there, and, um, and the location within the United States and Hawaii. And then I'll be talking about the reserved rights of Native Hawaiians in the Crown and government lands where military bases are located and about access through private and public land, including uh, military lands. So definition, um, Hawaiian, and in uh, Hawaiian we say, hey Hawaii au, I am of Hawaii, which meaning I am Hawaiian, or kanaka Hawaii, which translates into a person of Hawaii. Uh, and then for native Hawaiian, there are uh, two two general terms. One is Kanaka Maoli, which means native. Kanaka means person, Maoli means native, indigenous, and genuine. And Kanaka Maoli has become popular as a political way to acknowledge who we are as a people. 
Um, another, though, very good term, and which I tend to use, uh, prefer to use, is Kanaka Oivi, uh, which means native of the ancestral bone. And I like to use the term Oivi because it links us as Native Hawaiian people together through shared ancestry. And in our shared ancestry, our genealogies do all have a common ancestor uh, and ancestress with Papa the Earth Mother and Wakea the Sky Father. That unites us as a people through our ancestry, uh, not as a race of people, which is based on color and, and physical features, but through our ancestry, which links us and ties us to Hawaii, as well as um, links us culturally and through our language as well. Uh, now, another definition in terms of official definitions within the United States, uh, in 1921, Congress passed the Hawaii Home, Hawaiian Homestead Act. Um, in 1959, the Admission Act was passed. Uh, and in both of these congressional acts, uh, the, they use the term Native Hawaiian, small n, big H, and it, they define it as anyone who is a 50% uh, Hawaiian or more Hawaiian ancestry. So the first was the Hawaiian Homestead Act and said, in order to be a beneficiary of this trust, which is comprised of the Hawaiian government uh, and um, kingdom crown lands, you would need to have 50% or more Native Hawaiian ancestry. And so the Admission Act in 1959, um, when it defined who is a beneficiary of the um, a trust of lands that were being returned, the trust of crown and government lands of the Hawaiian kingdom that were being turned over to the state of Hawaii. It also, def re it, re it referred to the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act definition. In 1974, the Native Hawaiian Programs Act was passed and um, that act included uh, Native Hawaiians in the definition of who were Native Americans in order to qualify for the benefits that were being acknowledged for Native Americans. And they defined the um, person who, have, who is of Native Hawaiian ancestry as anyone who was a descendant of the Native peoples who occupied, uh, who were from Hawaii prior to 1778, were descended from people who lived in Hawaii prior to 1778. And this was followed up in 1993. There's the Apology Law, Public Law 103-150. And they use the term Native Hawaiian as anyone who has some Hawaiian ancestry also. This is a photograph of my family, my extended family. Um, most of us are, well, we vary from half to a quarter to three quarter Hawaiian. Um, and then, um, this is the definition then in the apology law. Uh, anyone who is a descendant of the Aboriginal people who prior to 1778 occupied and exercised sovereignty in the area that's now this, you know, Hawaii. And the reason why they added those terms occupied and exercised sovereignty is because that implies that uh, Hawaii was a sovereign entity uh, and that Native Hawaiians had a government through which to exercise our sovereignty over the Hawaiian Islands that was recognized as a government. And the uh, recognition that Native Hawaiians occupied and exercised sovereignty over Hawaii prior to first, uh, well, not first, but documented contact in 1778 also acknowledges that uh, Native Hawaiians were a, a self-governing people with our own government prior to the formation of the um, US government or the under the Constitution. Now, um, in recent time, there's been challenges to who is Hawaiian. Um, and so we've had to use more the term Native Hawaiian to speak of someone who is of the Hawaiian ancestry, uh, because Hawaiian is being claimed by non Hawaiian residents. Um, as a term that should apply to anyone who is a resident of Hawaii should be called Hawaiian as anyone who's from California is Californian or so. So um, 
now as Native Hawaiians to acknowledge that when we speak of ourselves, we are speaking of those of us who are of Hawaiian ancestry, we now use in English the term Native Hawaiian, uh, but in Hawaiian we use Kanaka Maoli or Kanaka Oivi. So uh, generally I use the term Kanaka Oivi to speak then of who are the indigenous people of Hawaii, anyone uh, any of whose ancestors lived in the area now Hawaii and exercise, occupied and exercised sovereignty in Hawaii. And to the, um, the Kanaka Oibi population, if we look over the years, um, at contact, um, the Cook expedition estimated um, between 400,000, uh, well, actually 250 to 400,000 um, Native Hawaiians, uh, but there have been scholars who have put the estimate as high as 800,000 people at the time of contact. In 1823, there was an initial missionary census of the islands, and there were, were 135,000 Native Hawaiians. And we see the result of the uh, introduction of diseases to which Native Hawaiians had no immunity, as well as the uh, cholera pandemic of 1804. And in this, we see that if you, if there were 400,000 Hawaiians, then two thirds of Native Hawaiians passed away within the first 50 years of contact without having descendants. And the higher figure, 800,000, would be 90% Hawaiians passing away without having descendants within the first 50 years of contact. Uh, in 1890, uh, which was the last census before the kingdom was overthrown, um, there were 40,642 Hawaiians, um, of which 34,436 were Maoli, that is of only Hawaiian ancestry, and 6,186 who were Oivi, who have any probably half Hawaiian, and they comprised 45% of the population. Uh, and in 1900, when Hawaii became a territory, um, there were 29,800 Kanaka Maoli and 7,800 Oivi, and comprising 24% of the population. But they made up, we made up the majority of the citizens because many of the population in Hawaii in 1900 were of uh, Chinese or Japanese ancestry, having come here to work on the plantations. So this is a chart showing the decline of the Native Hawaiian population and the rise of the part Hawaiian population in relation to other ethnic groups in Hawaii. So this would be the 800,000 is the um, number of uh, all Hawaiians, pure Hawaiians at the time of contact. And then they begin to start to look at the part Hawaiians here in 19, um, 1930 was the first time that there were more part Hawaiians than Hawaiians of uh, sole Hawaiian ancestry. And then we see the Caucasian, the Japanese, Filipino, Chinese uh, populations uh, beginning to grow in relation to the Native Hawaiian and uh, part Hawaiian populations. This shows where Hawaiians were in the United States in 2000. Um, in that year, about 45, percent of the Hawaiian population lived in the United States. You see high concentration here in California, um, also a, a good number in Washington State, as well as Nevada and Texas. And um, so 45 percent in um, the United States continent and 55 percent were in Hawaii. That has changed. Um, in 2023, with the American Community Survey, there is 680,000 Kanako Eevee, 41% um, of the Kanako Eevee living in Hawaii, and 59% living um, on the continent. In Hawaii, the 41% of Kanako Eevee comprise 21% of the Hawaii population, and there are 2,000 Kanako Oivi, who are, uh, who are Kanaka Maoli of pure Hawaiian ancestry. So um, there, that's the first part I wanted to just review um, when we speak of these reserved rights of Native Hawaiians, 
who are the Native Hawaiians we speak of. And the terminology, I request part two to talk about reserved rights in the Crown and government lands and also um, uh, the reserved rights in the lands of our ancestors. So I don't see any questions. So I'm going to proceed. So um, uh, we believe that um, the military lands that were um, uh, acquired through executive order or, uh, or um, I guess patents, I guess, were that they are Hawaiian national lands. Uh, lands that the military acquired through purchase or through condemnation. Um, well, even some of the condemned land might be Hawaiian national lands, but those lands that were that were not the originally crown and government lands uh, would be a, a different of a different status. But we're looking at the those lands that originally belonged to the crown and um, government at the time that private property was established. Those lands are Hawaiian national lands. So uh, in 1840, um, King Kamehameha III and the Council of Chiefs um, began to lay the foundation that set up a unique Hawaiian system of private ownership of the land. Uh, in 1840, they set up a constitution which acknowledged and made a statement about what were the rights of the people, the king and the chiefs in the land. And then in 1845, they began a process of designating privately owned lands. And in that process, they reserved the traditional and customary rights of the common people who are called the Makainana on the land. So this is what makes the system of ownership of land in Hawaii unique is this reservation of the rights of native the the traditional and customary rights of native hawaiians in the land i'm going to start to look at the process for defining what are the rights of native hawaiians in the land with the with the declaration of rights in 1839 and then proceed through the constitution and then through the laws that establish private property ownership uh, I do want to clarify that uh, as this process of establishing private ownership of land was evolving, uh, that process of establishing a constitutional government was also uh, de developing par parallel to this process. In other words, up until 1840, the Hawaiian uh, monarchy was an absolute monarchy, and all the rights of governance uh, and uh, authority was vested in the crown and the king. But it, beginning with the Declaration of Rights in 1839 and followed by the Constitution, there begins to be the separation out of the powers of the king uh, into a assigned legislative branch and a judicial branch and rights retained by the executive branch to the king. Uh, and then the process of establishing private property paralleled this. So in 1839, the Declaration of Rights stated, uh, protection is hereby secured to the persons of all the people together with their lands, their building lots, and all their property. And so this is an assurance uh, that the government will acknowledge the rights of the people in the land that they have traditionally held. The Constitution uh, defines that there are three uh, classes of people who have an interest in the land. And it also says that even though the king controls all the land from Hawaii to Ni'ihau, it was not his own private property. So this is the translation. Kamehameha I was the founder of the kingdom, and to him belonged the land from Hawaii to Ni'ihau though it was not his own private property. It belonged to the chiefs. Wait, I mean, it belonged to the chiefs. Sorry, it belongs to the people and the chiefs in common, of whom Kamehameha I was the head. 
and had the management of the landed property. So in other words, the king was holding the lands in trust for himself, but also for the chiefs and the people in common. And um, so this is important to understand because going into the process of establishing private ownership of land, which is a process where you provide title to one person, one individual, one entity to own the land. Um, the process that they, this is a process to separate out the undivided interests of the king, the chiefs, and the people in the land prior to uh, private property being established. And with regard to foreigners, in 1843, of uh, August 1843, the representatives and council passed a law saying, it is hereby unanimously declared that we will neither give away or sell any lands in future to foreigners, nor shall such gift or sale by any native be valid. So um, this is saying that the foreigners have no rights in the land at, at this point in time. And that although the, and all the rights in the land are common among the king, the chiefs, and the people, but foreigners do not have any rights to the land. And the reason why this was important is because in February of 1843, Great Britain took over control of Hawaii uh, over a dispute regarding ownership of land by their consul general in Hawaii. And um, at that time, when Great Britain took over the kingdom, then King Kamehameha III realized that if any government comes and takes over Hawaii, they automatically control all of the land because the land is not divided out among the chiefs and people or, and no one has private ownership. And therefore all the rights would automatically turn over to a foreign entity. And so when Great Britain um, restored the, the you know, withdrew and re sovereignty was restored to the Hawaiian kingdom, the king um, and the Council of Chiefs passed this law. The sovereignty was restored on uh, July 31st, 1843. And in August, 1843, this law was passed clarifying that foreigners do not have any rights in the land. At the same time though, the king acknowledged that he needed to begin a process to establish private rights of land ownership for the chiefs and the king himself and the people. So that if in the future, Hawaii was taken over, the um, interest in the private lands would still be upheld. So um, the next step in this process was on December 10th, 1845, when a board of commissioners to quiet land titles was established. And it says, for the investigation and final ascertainment or rejection of all claims of private individuals, whether natives or foreigners, to any landed property acquired anterior to the passage of the act. And the Board of Commissioners was pretty much evenly divided between Hawaiians and uh, non-Hawaiians. Um, here you have John Papa'i'i, who was a, a, a chief who had been in the court of Kamehameha and had uh, helped record the uh, lands that the king had awarded in his, in his reign. Azora Babela Ka'awai, who was a, a lesser chief and a li'i. Um, William Richards, who was a missionary to Hawaii. Uh, John Rickard, who was, uh, had come to Hawaii and was the Attorney General under the new government that was evolving. And James Young Kanehoa, who was uh, half Hawaiian and half Haole and um, the son of John Young, a British uh, military advisor to Kamehameha I. So two Hawaiians of full Hawaiian ancestry, two foreigners, uh, Caucasian, and then someone who's half Hawaiian and half Caucasian. British. Okay, the next step is that on February 14, 1846, the Board of Commissioners issued a notice in the Polynesian newspaper, and in it, it had the deadline for native claims to be filed as two years from the date of publication, making it February 14, 1848. On September 5, I'm sorry, on October 26, 1846, the Board of Commissioners adopted 
principles which will guide them in their adjudication of the claims presented to them. So now the common people had two years to submit their claim and to also submit a survey of the land for which they had to pay around $12, and then also to submit statements of at least two witnesses um, as to the fact that this was land that they had occupied and had cultivated and resided upon. Um, and um, the, the chiefs and the, and the king would begin to meet to de decide what land the king was going to get free of the chief's claims and what land the chief was going to get free of the king's claims. But what the Board of Commissioners uh, did through this is to uh, articulate what were the existing practices and policies of land tenure in Hawaii. What were the traditionally recognized policies about land tenure? And these principles then were articulated and were used then to guide the commissioners in deciding what lands the king would be awarded, what lands the chief would be awarded, chiefs rather, and what lands the common people would be awarded. So one of the principles is it being therefore fully established that there are but three classes of persons having vested rights in the land, first the government, second the landlord, and third the tenant, it next becomes necessary to ascertain the proportional rights of each. And I like to show this three-layered cake because it represents the a nature of traditional land tenure in Hawaii. And it says, a tract of land now in the hands of a landlord and occupied by tenants, if all parts of it were equally valuable, might be divided into three equal parts and an allodial or private title to one then be given to the Lord and the same title to be given to the tenants of one third and the other one third would remain in the hands of the king as to his proportional right. So I wanted to explain this concept because um, this process is called kamahele, the dividing of the land. And sometimes when we envision this process, you know, there's a pie chart and it says, okay, this percentage went to the king, this percentage went to the chiefs, this percentage went to the people. But that's not what the division was about. The division was about separating the undivided interests of the king, the chiefs, and the people in common in land. So every, every land in Hawaii where it was occupied also by tenants had these three layers of interest. The king, who controlled all the land from Hawaii to Ni'ihau, the chiefs who were awarded land, some through um, their ancestors from the king uh, as uh, to, to have the authority over it, to supervise it, to govern the people under it. And then thirdly, the land that the tenants were given either from the king or from the chiefs. Um, but they all had common interest in the land, common title. So the process of the mahele was to divide out those interests where each would have to agree to remove their interest from the land that was being awarded to the one person. Now the first step in this process was called the official Kamahele was proclaimed in 1848 and recorded in the Mahele book. And this is a picture of the Mahele book. In the Mahele book on the left side is recorded all the lands um, I thought I had a picture of it, but I guess I don't. In the left side is recorded all the lands the king is claiming for himself and from which the chiefs agree to remove their interest. On the right side of the book are all the lands that the chiefs are claiming as theirs and from which the king has agreed to remove his interest. So in this mahele between the chiefs and the king, the king um, actually claimed almost 2 million acres, or the king claimed 2 million acres, and um, he then turned over half to the government to be distinct from the crown. So the king acknowledges that uh, in order for a government to exist and to operate, it needs to have a land base, a substantial land base, 
from which to conduct its business, on which to conduct its business, and through which to regenerate revenue. So the king then uh, kept 984,000 acres as his privately owned land for he and his heirs. Sorry. Um, the government received 1,523,000 acres, um, about a million from the king and other lands that were uh, commuted to the government by the chiefs as payment for receiving their land award. And then there were 245 chiefs who were awarded collectively 1,619,000 acres. So this is all of the land, how it was agreed upon between the king, the chiefs, what lands they would remove their interest from mutually, and the king in turn turning over half of those lands to the government. Now the law that um, awarded the land to the government and to the crown had this reservation and hence this term that I'm using reservation of rights and in um, the translation of the Hawaiian term uh, phrase is reserving only the right of the people who live on the aforementioned lands. So while the king and the chiefs have agreed what lands they are removing their interests from so the other may hold title there are still the people who live on the lands who have their claim filed with the board of commissioners and which the board of commissioners will need to acknowledge and to grant to the common people uh, and to which the chiefs must agree that they will uh, remove their interest or the king has to agree to remove his interest depending on if it's a crown land, government land, or private land. So um, you have the filing of the claims by the common people by February 14, 1848, and these are awarded under the Kuleana Act of 1850. The people had until 1854 to complete and submit all of the information required to validate their claim, that is the survey and the payment of um, the money for the survey and the presenting of witnesses. Uh, through this Kuleana Act, 8,205 Hoa'aina, or they're calling tenants on the land, which is about 29% of the adult males, although both women and men got land. Uh, collectively, the Hoa'aina, only a small, less than 30% of the Hoa'aina, got less than 1% of the lands. Um, the total amount awarded was 28,600 acres collectively. Uh, 28,600 acres can fit into the smallest of the islands. Koholave is 28,800 acres. So the amount of land the common people got is equal in size to the smallest of the Hawaiian islands, Koholave. And then, you know, the king and the chiefs together then pretty much divided up land equal in size to the rest of the islands. Um, in 1850, the uh, uh, legislature and council of chiefs passed a law now allowing foreigners to have claims that they made uh, awarded to them. So this law, 1850, is called the Act to Abolish the Disabilities of Aliens to Acquire and Convey Land in Fee Simple. And so for the first time, um, now foreigners have recognized rights of ownership in land and uh, they can buy it or sell it. And so they also had filed claims and the, they were awarded claims. It's interesting to note that there are many Pacific islands where foreigners still are unable to own land. Um, uh, Notably, Tahiti, you have to be Maohi or Tahitian, uh, uh, indigenous Tahitian to own land in Tahiti. Uh, in um, um, uh, Samoa, you have to be 51% Samoan, which means you have to bo have both parents who are Samoan and be able to make a land claim. But in Hawaii, very early in 1850, they allowed non-Hawaiians to own land. Now, in looking at the numbers of Hawaiians who did not make a land claim, 
uh, for a long time, uh, it was it was believed and, and the practice was to say that the whole Aina um, lost their right to claim the land um, by not claiming it in 1848. But myself, many other Hawaiian scholars are of the belief that those rights are still vested in the land and that the whole Aina uh, still have vested rights in the crown land and government lands especially many of which are the military lands, as well as private lands, and these rights are remain reserved. Um, this is what the thinking was when um, the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act was set up. Now, between 1850 and 1860, the government auctioned off 144,000 acres so that Native people and foreigners who had not been awarded lands under the Kuleana Act could purchase land. In that process, 64% was sold to foreigners and 36% was sold to Kanaka OEV. And, uh, and the Kanaka OEV collectively got 51,840 acres. This was more land that they acquired collectively under the Kuleana Act. And in this process, what the Kanaka OEV did was to pool their money together in order to bid on land. So they formed land hui, land organizations. They pulled their resources and they bid for these lands and were awarded them. Um, okay, so um, their nature of the reserved rights, first is that the crown and government lands, a lot of which are military lands, are encumbered with the vested rights of the Hoa'aina that were never separated out. And these reserved rights of Kanako Evi in the crown lands were acknowledged by Prince Kuhio, who was a U.S. delegate to Congress from 1900 to 19, um, 1902 to 1922. And the U.S. Congress um, acknowledged these claims when the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act was set up and passed in 1921, acknowledging that the common people still had rights in these lands that were never separated out, and that if the kingdom had continued, these lands would have been awarded to the Native Hawaiians and 200,000 acres of crown and government lands from the Hawaiian Kingdom were uh, assigned for Native Hawaiians of 50% or more Hawaiian ancestry to homestead. So under the Admissions Act, it's a little hard to see here, sorry, the uh, when um, at the time of annexation, uh, and between the time of annexation and the Organic Act, the Republic of Hawaii ceded to the U.S. government 1,800,000 acres. At the time of statehood, uh, oh, and then these 1,800,000 acres were held in trust by the federal government. They were not put to uh, owned by the government. They were held as a trust for the benefit of the inhabitants of Hawaii. And um, the lands uh, under the Admission Act, the federal government for got retained 400,000 acres, most of which had been set aside during the territorial period through executive order for parks, national parks, and for military bases. So the 400,000 acres, actually most of those lands are for national parks, Hawaii Volcanoes National Park, uh, Haleakala National Park, um, uh, and then of course the military bases. Uh, at the same time, the land that had been set aside in 1921 for Native Hawaiians to homestead was dedicated and the, um, the Admission Act mandates that the state of Hawaii uh, continue to retain and sustain the uh, Hawaiian Homelands Trust for Native Hawaiians. And that was um, approximately 200,000 acres. Then there are 1,200,000 acres balance and that was turned over to the state of Hawaii. And that land is managed as the public lands, uh, the, sorry, this ceded public lands trust. So in the Admissions Act, it says that the ceded public lands trust that's now being set aside for the state of Hawaii to use will be used for five purposes. And the first is the betterment of the conditions of Native Hawaiians as defined by the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act. 
So that's where I said that, you know, they also use the 50% or more Hawaiian. And so um, uh, this is the uh, first condition, acknowledging Native Hawaiians reserved rights in these lands ongoing, that uh, the ceded public lands purpose is for the betterment of the conditions of Native Hawaiians. The other four purposes are for public education and our public schools and our University of Hawaii campuses are on these lands. Uh, the third is for home and farm ownership. And so some of these lands are set aside for housing development under the Department of Housing and Community Development, and some are leased out for agricultural farming. The fourth purpose is public improvements. And so these are lands, state lands for um, uh, roads and uh, freeways and um, piers and docks and uh, for the airports. Um, and um, the fifth is public uses and public uses are for um, parks, state parks and uh, conservation lands and forest reserves. So the seated public lands are, as I said at the beginning of this section, considered Hawaiian national lands. And uh, the lands proclaimed for military and national parks, um, the Hawaiian homelands and the ceded public lands trust are all Hawaiian national lands. Originally lands that were for the crown and the government of the kingdom of Hawaii that were illegally claimed by the um, illegal provisional government of Hawaii and then continued to be claimed by the Republic of Hawaii and then the Republic of Hawaii turns over what its spurious claim is to these lands to the federal government, the US federal government, which holds it in trust and then turns it over to the state of Hawaii. So the genealogy of the lands that are now held by the state and federal governments traces back to the illegal act of the overthrow of the Hawaiian monarchy by the US government. And, there, and in the public law, uh, 103150, the apology law, it acknowledges that these lands were acquired uh, illegally and that the Hawaiian people never surrendered their claims to these lands, either through a publicite of a, a referendum or through acknowledgement and, and you know, signing over a deed. And the Native Hawaiians, we still believe that these we have reserved rights and vested rights in these lands. And as this is the Public Law 103150 statement, the indigenous people never directly relinquished their claims to their inherent sovereignty as a people or over their national lands to the United States, either through their monarchy or through a plebiscite or referendum. Under the um, Hawaii State Constitution, the beneficiaries for the ceded public lands are defined in Article 12, Section 4. And it says that the lands that the state holds in trust, the ceded public lands trust, is held as a public trust for Native Hawaiians and the general public. And so again, the state acknowledges the vested rights, the reserved rights that Native Hawaiians continue to hold in these crown and government lands. And Section uh, Article 12, Section 5 of the Hawaii State Constitution establish the Office of Hawaiian Affairs to receive the revenues or the lands themselves from the ceded public lands trust that are to be used for the benefit, the betterment of the conditions of Native Hawaiians. All right, so I'm now going to continue to the second part of the reserved rights um, discussion. I'll just pause and see if you have any questions, you can put it in the chat. But um, the first part, so the first part again was their definitions. This first part of the reserved rights section reviewed how as Native Hawaiians continue to have reserved rights in the crown and government lands that is held by the state and federal governments um, that was acquired through the illegal overthrow of the Hawaiian monarchy. Now I'm gonna talk about the reserved rights that were uh, uh, set aside or acknowledged by the um, King and Council of Chiefs when Hawaiian uh, private land system was established and which is um, 
uh, encumbered in the uh, land awards and the land patents that were issued for ownership of private land in Hawaii. So all private land in Hawaii, when these awards were first issued, the first um, land patents and royal patents were issued, all had a reservation of rights, um, the rights um, uh, of access through private and public lands for subsistence, cultural and religious purposes. And this is what makes the land system, the private land system in Hawaii uniquely Hawaiian and not completely Western. So in 1850, when the Privy Council and the King are deliberating on the process of private property being established, uh, it says the King was concerned that a little bit of land that is being granted to the people, even with a lodial title or private title, if they, the people, be cut off from all other privileges, would be of very little value. Because traditionally, even though the families um, had tenure and cultivated uh, individual plots or selected plots, they had access to go freely to the mountains to gather what they needed for firewood or for house building. Um, or canoe making, and they also had free rights of access to the ocean for food and gathering. So the proposition of the king, which he inserted as the seventh clause of the law, that is the 1850 Kuleana Act, as a rule for the claims of common people to go to the mountains and the seas attached to their own particular lands exclusively is agreed. So this is the 1850 Kuleana Act. When the landlords have taken allodial or private titles to their lands, the people on each of their lands shall not be deprived of the right to take firewood, house timber, aho cord, thatch, or tea leaf from the land on which they live for their own private use. This is not a commercial right, it's a private subsistence right, should they need them. But they shall not have a right to take such articles to sell for profit. So it's not a commercial right. They shall also inform the landlord or his agent and proceed with his consent. The people shall also have a right to drinking water and running water and the right of way. Now in the state archives, there are petitions. And this is one of the petitions and the signatures, the portion of the signatures. 54 Makainana, common people in Kaneohe. And they're petitioning their legislator in um, and saying we're in trouble because we have no firewood and no la e tea leaf and no timber for houses we who live on lands which have no forest we're in trouble the children are eating raw potato because of no firewood the mouths of the children are swollen from having eaten raw taro we have been in this trouble for three months. The Konohikis with wooded lands here in Kaneohe have absolutely withheld the firewood in Lai and timber for houses. Now, I don't see in the preview record where the, um, the discussion of changing the law, but in July of 1851, Section 7 of the Kuleana Act was amended, and the requirement for tenants to obtain permission of the landlords was deleted. And since 1851, through the provisional government, through the republic, through the territory, and now under the state, the law has read as it does now, as Hawaii Revised Statutes, um, uh, Chapter 7-1, whereas the landlords, etc., have attained, people should not be deprived to take the five items, firewood, house timber, quite the list five items, um, for their own private use, they should not have a right to take it for profit, but there's no requirement for uh, receiving the permission before entering the land. In addition to um, that law, which was uh, from the time of the Kuleana Act to present, in 1892, a year before the overthrow of the Hawaiian Kingdom, the Kingdom adopts common law and Hawaiian usage uh, and that law is currently Hawaii Revised Statutes, Chapter 1, Section 1. And it says here that the common law of England, et cetera, is declared to be common law 
of the state of Hawaii, as well as the fix, those fixed by Hawaii judicial precedent or established by Hawaiian usage. In 1978, the uh, Hawaii had a constitutional convention. And as of 1978, the Constitution, Article 12, Section 7, also reaffirms the rights of uh, entry onto private land for traditional and customary purposes. And it states, the state reaffirms and shall protect all rights customarily and traditionally exercised for subsistence, cultural, and religious purposes and possessed by Ahupua tenants who are descendants of native Hawaiians who inhabited the Hawaiian Islands prior to 1778. Uh, but then it added, subject to the right of the state to regulate such rights, meaning it can regulate how many people can go at a time, when, day daytime, night, maybe not nighttime, um, uh, vehicle, no vehicle, uh, etc. So um, kuleana means um, both rights and responsibilities. Kuleana rights are those rights that are afforded to Native Hawaiians in order to allow us to fulfill our responsibilities as Native Hawaiians, to provide food for our families, to, um, to honor our, our deities, to honor our loved ones through cultural and um, spiritual practices. Uh, and so these rights are accorded to Native Hawaiians, the right of entry through uh, undeveloped private and public lands uh, to gather what we need for uh, subsistence, cultural, and religious purposes. Uh, these rights um, under the state laws can only occur on undeveloped or what they call less than fully developed lands. This is not a right that can be exercised on land that's zoned and used for residential purposes. So um, what are some of the resources that Native Hawaiians enter on and through public lands and private lands? to gather for subsistence, cultural, and religious purposes. Uh, these are some of the lands, um, native plants, aquatic species, fish spotting sites, turtle nesting areas, surfing sites, sandy shorelines, salt ponds, stream baths, seam baths rather, um, springs, um, fishing shrines, uh, Puuhonoa refuge areas, birthing stones, historic sites, burials and burial grounds, the night marcher routes, the our spirits and the Kani Moon march along given paths, um, places to experience spiritual visions we call Hoai Lona. Um, in Maui County, there are these cliff jumping spots that Kai Kili and his warriors would jump to show their prowess. Uh, places where, um, uh, usually on the western sides of our islands, are the places we call Lena, where the souls jump into the next world and, and make that transition into the next realm. And on this island, Ka'ena, Ka'ena Point is a Lena. Um, Molokai is out on the um, far side at, at Momomi. So lava tubes, uh, landing for landing areas for canoes and boats, uh, alaya veins, ads making workshops, etc. And those are just a sample of these kind of resources that are used for traditional and customary purposes along the coastline. It doesn't include a list of the um, practices on the in the forest and on the land. I just do want to end with covering um, elements of traditional and customary practice. Um, and this is what I use. I've been an expert witness in about three or four cases where people were arrested exercising their traditional right of uh, traditional practices. Um, and this is what I look for that the purpose, the purpose of the person entering on or through public land for to gather what, um, for subsistence or cultural uh, religious purpose. So the purpose is to provide for our extended family or for the community and to fulfill our kuleana, our responsibility related to subsistence, religious, and cultural needs. Uh, that the person who is claiming to be the cultural practitioner has been trained in this practice by an elder, 
either in a formal halal or school of training or from a, a relative, an uncle, an aunt, a grandparent, a parent, um, that the practice is conducted in an area to which the person has a traditional connection and is fulfilling a kuliana. That is, their, this is a place where their family had traditional gathered. The elder who taught them is the area where they had gathered um, and that they're taking care of this place and not just take, 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 but also making sure that the resources remain healthy. That the practitioner is taking responsibility for the resources for the area. That it is for subsistence and not for commercial use. And it's in a manner consistent with Native Hawaiian tradition and custom, usually accompanied with prayer, asking permission to gather this particular resource. Examples of uh, access rights that have been acknowledged by the military in Hawaii, um, the Protecto Alavi Ohana, uh, when it was undergoing its struggle to um, stop the military training that was taking place on the island of Koholabe, we were afforded access to the island under the American Indian Religious Freedom Act. Um, and uh, the U.S. Marines at Mokapu, the U.S. Navy at Ford Island, Mokuume Ume, the U.S. Army at Makua, and um, the Air Force at Bellows have all acknowledged uh, access rights for Native Hawaiians for makahiki and other cultural uh, ceremonies as well. Again, um, under both the, well, acknowledging these rights, but also under American Indian Religious Freedom and the uh, Religious Freedom Act, uh, as well as um, Nohili for years on Kauai acknowledged access for uh, Hawaiian families to do fishing on the weekend. Okay, so that concludes my presentation. Uh, again, if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat or in the comments. Um, and I thank you for uh, joining us today and for your attention. And um, hopefully this has, will help you in your work with Native Hawaiian communities in Hawaii. Thank you so much, Dr. McGregor. If anyone has a question and would like to unmute yourself, please feel free to do so. Or put in a question in the chat. And many thanks for joining us. Uh, we are planning to hold an in-person Native Hawaiian Culture Communications and Consultation course um, in mid-August. So be on the lookout for a flyer and hope you can join us there in, on Oahu.